Okay, so welcome, Andrew and Jessica. Um, we're looking forward to this discussion today about systems and how we might be able to invest in them to make them work better. Um, so maybe we should start. The first question is, when you think about systems, how, what are we talking about? How do you begin, you know, is it what system? Um, what does it look like? What are its characteristics? How do you begin to approach the idea that, let's say, our child and family service system or human development system is failing us? It's not working well. Kids are falling through the cracks. So we start with that. Then where do we go from there in terms of thinking about systems? Andrew, do you want to start, start us off? <laughs> Let me, let me have a go. I, okay. I, think, I think often when people talk about systems, um, the, the conversation often goes to very big systems and people start to think about government systems, national okay. systems, international okay. systems and so on. But um, I, I think a starting point for me is actually the, the system is almost what you define. It, it can be very small. You can, you can start mm -hmm. with a village and a community. Um, uh. And, and look at what's actually happening within the system there. It's about the players and the pieces that come together to cause things to happen. So I, I think a starting point for your question, Laurie, is actually to really, first of all, define the scope and the nature of the system you're thinking about, and then start to deeply understand the players and the things that are going on within it. Um, you don't have to leap straight towards that big national change, because frankly, if you do, you're, you're leaping to the end of the system that's hardest to change, most difficult, it's going to take the most time, it's most obscure, hard to understand. You know, mm. it's um, big, big isn't necessarily beautiful when it comes to systems change. Right. So I'll build on what you've just said, Andrew. <laughs> and just to say, Lori, a, a little disclaimer is that, you know, Portugal's just like, many of the other foundations um, gl globally that are part of the ECD, the Global ECD Funders Group, um, we're, we have an aspiration to be more focused. We are focused on system change, but we're still learning how to do it. I think a lot of us made that shift towards a more systemic way of working um, in the last maybe five, 10 years. And um, we've been having some success ourselves, but we're still exploring the best ways to go about, go about doing it. So the examples I'm going to share and, you know, my thoughts are coming from our experience, but just to say that we don't have necessarily all of the answers on how to do it well, but hopefully some insights that might be helpful to, to the group. And the first thing that I would say um, in relation to what Andrew was saying, I would actually jump off and, and challenge this thinking about systems, actually, and using the term systems. And one of the terms that I've been using a lot in, in the work that I'm doing is ecosystem instead of system, because system often implies something that's rather linear. If I, haven't, if I make an input here or a series of inputs here, and I follow this chain, then I will get to a certain output and hopefully a certain outcome, right? But when we think about ecosystems, the focus is really on the interconnectedness and the relationships that are in that larger um, context, if you will. And I have a tendency to think now, as you know, we're going about the work with our partners, what is the overall ecosystem and what are all of the issues, not even related to early childhood development, but deeper causes in terms of social inequities that, early child, that are showing up as symptoms in the early childhood system? how do those fit? And then how can we zero in on maybe one of the systems? And, you know, according to what Andrew was just saying, not necessarily even the government, but maybe even a community type of system with municipal government, act, uh, you know, actors as one part of it, but within kind of a subsystem within this larger ecosystem where there are so many interconnected pieces and, and players. And, not just think about finding one trajectory that's a little bit linear, but multiple entry points and multiple interventions that would all um, complement each other and sometimes you know, overlap and, and, and cross. So a lot of times we have a tendency to use like a logic model to explain things and to share that with our board and say, okay, this is how it's going to happen. And we know that the context where we're working they're not static. Even you know if we have a five-year theory of change or a five-year plan, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things going on around that that are changing and we have to change uh, according to that too. And sometimes this logic model, it's helpful to have a structure to start off with, 
in terms of thinking about how do we think things are going to happen, mm -hmm. but really trying to focus less on those outputs, which tend to be more concrete and more on the outcomes, which are the unknowns, but yeah. where we're aiming for, you know, as funders, it's be beyond our zone of control, but really where the, the change uh, that we want to see is, is going to take place. Can we talk a bit, just the way the conversation is going, can, can you talk a bit more about how you can help people, um, not necessarily boards, I guess, as well as staff, um, to be more comfortable with that uncertainty? I mean, that's what we're talking about is that whatever we're doing, we really have to be agile. We really do have to be responsive and adaptive. Um, how, and do you have any examples of how you sort of help people move in that direction to be more comfortable with ambiguity? Lots of examples. Andrew, do you want to <laughs> jump in? Yeah, let me leave the examples to, to you, Jessica. But um, sure. I, I think you're touching on a really critical point, Laurie. I, to, to be blunt, I don't think systems changes for all foundations. Um, and if you're not willing to start with some real dialogues with the board to understand their, their willingness and openness for that kind of flexibility. Um, and it's not, it's not just flexibility, it's, it's time frames, it's tangibility as well. You know, many, many boards want to see the effect of their money. They, um, you know, the, the benefit of replacing a church roof is you see a new church roof. Um, and, and that's very tangible and it's very real. And for some board members, that, that's important. Um, you know, other foundations are just very, very good at responding to emergency needs here and now, actually. And, you know, and again, if we if we don't have foundations doing that kind of thing, we'd be in a difficult place. So I, I, I don't think we should start with the assumption that this is for everyone. But um, the starting point, I think, though, if you, if you think that systems change is right, is a dialogue with your board to really test that willingness. Um, but also to take them with you in that process of more clearly defining the system, better understanding the the kind of change that might help. Um, and I, I think Jessica's ecosystem uh, analogy is, is perfect in terms of really beginning to understand how the bits interoperate, frankly, accepting the, the reality that as a, as a foundation, um, there's not one lever you can pull here that's going to cause a change. You know, the best you can hope with a, an ecosystem is to nudge it, to persuade it, to, to shift it a little more in a direction. And that, that, that requires a certain humbleness and, um, reflection. I think that only comes out of discussion and, and genuine discussion over time. I think um, it's a bit too easy just to sort of jump on a bandwagon here and sort of say, of course we want this, you know, it's just, it's just like we want sun sunny days and we want people to be nice. Um, it's not, it doesn't necessarily fit every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think that's true. And, and one of the things um, that we certainly noticed in Australia, there was tremendous interest in place-based collective impact as a new way of securing change and community-based, involved, engaged, all of that. And those outcomes are very long-term. So trying to say, well, we think at the moment that if you do this, you'll get that. If you do that, you'll get that, which is a bit linear. Um, but being sensitive to those different levers. Um, but I think it's trying the patience of people who have invested in these efforts. Um, so I'm not quite sure. I mean, that even if you take it at the local level, like a community-based effort, um, that requires governments to share power, um, which is something that isn't always easy and requires philanthropists also to maybe share power, treat people as equals. Um, which is something maybe we could talk about a bit is that that shift from, you know, I'm the funder and you're the fundee and you come to me and we make an agreement and then you go do what you do and then you tell me what you've done, et cetera, as more of a partnership. Um, have, what do you think about that? If we're thinking about systems and the fact that they are very complex, lots of different levers, lots of different entry points, how do we begin to develop those relationships that take the power hats off around the table? Well, I think, yeah, the relationships are, are really, really important. Um, and I think it's important to also say, Laurie, around that 
you can't change systems or ecosystems from the outside. You need to dive in <laughs> and you need to take your hat off. But there's also an expectation that, um, you know, you are a funder and you have that asset, the funding that is needed, that you're bringing to the table. And I characterize myself as much as possible in the partnerships that I'm a part of as the funding partner, you know, so I'm, I'm another partner with these assets sitting around the table and right. well aware that there's still a lot of, um, a power dynamics that come with being the one who has the funding or being one of the ones who, who has the funding. Um, yep. but just knowing that if, if we don't jump in and, and be part of, uh, of this full collaboration, uh, we're not going to be able to change because changing systems is about changing those components, the structural pieces, right? And, and this document that you had shared with us, the FSG one, I'm hoping you'll share that with the group if they haven't seen it. Yeah. It's really, it, it's really great because you've got these structural pieces that are, you know, the focus of a lot of our efforts, the policies, the practices, the, you know, domestic resource financing, all of this, but then you also have the relationships. And I feel like we often ignore that, but how we go about producing impact is just as important as the impact we're all aiming um, and hoping to have some contribution towards, right? To Andrew's point that we can't really um, attribute a lot of our, our work directly, yes. often a contribution together with a lot of others. And I would say um, there's a couple of things that we've been doing um, and what I would also characterize as the potential of philanthropy, right? I mean, we all say that we want to focus on systems and for those where it is appropriate and we can take, there's a, a couple of, um, of key um, ideas that I, I would share. One is about, you know, the long-term engagement to build up those relationships, both the, the grantees um, mm -hmm. and trying to do the same to support grantees to do that with their beneficiaries and really, really promote this idea of meaningful participation because we want the relationships to be solid and we want the impact of the work to be sustainable. There needs to be that engagement. This is something that we've learned um, through one of, one of uh, the partnerships, one of the examples I can give, the Saving Brains uh, Community of Practice, which is um, a project of Grand Challenges Canada. Particus has come in to be a funding partner with uh, Grand Challenges Canada in creating this, uh, first it was an in-person now because of COVID virtual community of practice. And when COVID hit, um, we had the opportunity to do a bit of a spin-off to the regular community of practice, which is the most of the work of Saving Brains is about supporting innovative organizations who have a new initiative on ECD to strengthen the core systems around that initiative so that they can go to scale. And when COVID came, we took the opportunity to examine what kind, what is an effective leader in a situation like COVID who can support in a very unstable, unknown situation, this initiative to go to scale. So um, they interviewed a number of different leaders of organizations to, to really get at what is it, what makes a resilient leader in a situation like this. And they, mm -hmm. The Saving Brains team has built a kind of uh, resilience framework that's part of the mentorship that they do for the innovators around what they learned from um, engaging and, and interviewing and, and speaking with those leaders. And um, one of the most important things that came out of it, Andrew might want to say a little bit more about this too, is this idea that systems leaders really connect with the communities that they are a part of. They really prioritize those relationships. They don't put themselves at the, or even their initiative at the center of what they're trying to do. When they do a mapping, they really map widely to really understand the landscape and the context where they're trying to influence and who is key in helping them in the pathway. And they, they really put you know, the change that they want to see at the center of what they're trying to do and all of the people who are involved with it. So that long-term engagement and the investment in the relationships, I would say, is really important. Um, the second one is convenings. Um, we have a tendency in the programs that I manage at the global level to focus on collaborations, building collaborations of partners within the framework of a program. So I have a program theory of change with a series of uh, outcomes, and that offers the framework to build the partnership with a number of different stakeholders and actors at different levels of the global ecosystem on ECD um, for, you know, to act as a unit in the overall sector. Well, 
And then um, we're also within the, the focus of the program framework, we have a number of different learning communities like Saving Brains that we're investing in. Um, and we're also about to start nurturing um, collaborations among regional networks. There's a really strong one actually in Asia that if your members don't know about, they might, might want to, to look into, which is RNEC, the Asia Pacific Regional ECD Network. And trying to help these regional networks collaborate more together and to form peer learning communities of members um, on different topics that are of interest to them. So we are doing a lot of, uh, a lot of peer community, peer learning communities and, and collaborations because it comes back to that, how you go about producing impact is just as important as the impact itself and connecting and networking across the sector is really important. And the last thing I would say um, is we're exploring at Portica something that we refer to now as the global local dynamic, which means we're trying to link, to value and to link the expertise, the experience, the evidence in all of its uh, forms at the, at the grassroots and local level. And local can mean a, a number of different things depending on you know, the context. A lot of times we have a tendency to, to, to speak of it as though it's really the grassroots, but linking that, which is often undervalued, but extremely important to have the kind of impact that we're looking for, linking that with the global frameworks and the global expertise and the global science, for example, the science of ECD coming out of the Harvard Center, really linking that together and saying, if we want to see impact at a truly global scale, then we need to value all of these assets and, and connect, create a kind of bi-directional um, learning process of exchange between them and not just value what's coming from, from the global like, uh, like we normally do when we're making decisions and really hope that the global uh, level actors will learn and, and value um, just as much as the, as the local ones are. So I would say, yeah, that those would be the three things that I would suggest to invest in, in strengthening, strengthening the sector. What I, what I find interesting um, about those Porticus examples is that, you know, they, they illustrate a couple of really important things about systems change for me, you know, but one, one is that, yeah, while we talk about this kind of being long term and unpredictable, that's not an excuse for saying we don't have a theory, we don't, we don't have a rationale or an idea that sits behind it, um, right. that, that we don't have expectations of what we think might happen. Um, that, that's critically important. And, you know, in the examples you were just giving, Jessica, that, that sense of we've got a problem in the system at the moment, which is a lack of communication and collaboration in both directions between global and local, for example, in that final example, um, is there. And, and, you know, that leads to then thinking about well, what are the kind of things that we can do that might improve that and change it? Um, what, what are the kind of relationships we can build? What are the kind of investments that we can make that will have you know, genuinely long-term effects that continue once the, the donors stepped out of it. So, you know, for, for me, that's one of the underlying rationale that, that takes many foundations towards a systems change um, uh, situation. It's a recognition that, that even with the, the millions that, that some, some foundations are able to pump in, that's not enough for, for the billions that many systems change um, challenges uh, really require. So, so you are only a player in there and your, your ability with your millions is to try and affect the system so that when you pull out, the system carries on doing something new and different long-term. That's, you know, that's the exactly. ultimate um, idea we're, we're, we're sort of selling and promoting, I guess, with, with systems change thinking. Um, and the kind of partners can... too. Andrew, this, I know this resonates with you because we're invested in that, Laurie, but um, for your benefit, the kind of partners that we've realized we need to be more active with to achieve this kind of impact really are networks and collaborations. So coming back to the example I gave of the EC regional networks, these are entities that have such a broad reach. They've got, you know what, the, they've got, the regional networks have national network members. Those national networks, um, you know, they have uh, grassroots and more local level members. When you put them all together, when you link up these four regional networks as we're aiming to do now, you've got a reach that goes vertically across the entire globe as well as horizontally. And if you really want to understand, you know, to collect as much evidence on what works, you have to have that kind of reach. It, it's really powerful. And 
together with linking the networks um, with each other around, they're gonna do some collaboration around ECD workforce issues that's come out as a really key um, topic for them. So that's what many of them will be, will be working on together over the next three, four or five years. Um, we've also been building a collaborative of donors to sustain these networks. Um, the Open Society, and it, it's really about extending and, and building off of what Open Society Foundation has been doing for the last 18 years. Um, some of your members may know Open Society had an ECD program that was running at 18, 20 years, and it just closed down at the end of last year. And, in, you know, they have spent, eight, you know, something to the tune of 18, 20 million euro, U.S. dollars as well in creating and sustaining these uh, regional ECD networks, which are such critical for this learning and exchange and you know, in system impact. And we wanted as a community of funders to make sure that that investment that OSF has made is going to be sustained and you know, that the regional networks can continue functioning because we need them just as much as they need us, more so actually. So the aim was to build a, a funder collaborative alongside the regional network collaborative and to help funders work together. You know, coming back to, to this point we were discussing earlier about, you know, is system change for every foundation? Maybe not. And if, if you are a foundation where your board is not so comfortable working in the abstract and you need to have more tangible uh, results at the end of a certain period of time, an, an important step that you could take is to work within a collaborative of other foundations who can work in the abstract. So you joining forces and bringing your expertise and your resources to bear on a larger, um, a larger collective aim. So something for, for members to think about perhaps as well. Absolutely. Um, can we, can you give us some examples? <laughs> I mean, as I'm listening to you, one of the things I'm thinking is that, okay, we're talking about creating networks of networks and, and these sort of complex systems and trying to see if they can kind of work together. Um, and I jumped to at some point, gosh, how do we do that? Um, I, in, in Australia at the moment, there's a major campaign to get universal access to early learning and care. It's hard to believe we don't have it yet, but we don't. So there's a major campaign. And that has stimulated discussion about, well, okay, so we get them in the door. What happens when they are in the door? Do we have the skilled workforce then to be able to facilitate the healthy growth and development that we'd like? So it's in the doors one thing, and that's kind of a campaign, but then we need to think about what happens once they are in the door and how do we, how do we think about workforce development um, with a very complicated workforce in the early years sector. Um, highly trained, um, tertiary trained, master's level, and cert fours from you know, TAFE colleges. A huge range of people are in that sector. And so one of the things that we're thinking about is, so what do you do? How do, how do we scale up to be sure that we've got a workforce at all those different levels, which will be able to facilitate the healthy growth and development of the kids? once they're in the door. <laughs> um, I have a couple of ideas that come to mind and coming back to the networks again. So what, there's an initiative by the, the, European, um, the European ECD network, which is called ESA. And it's a partnership between ESA and a consultancy based in Washington DC called Results for Development. It is called the Early Childhood Workforce Initiative. And what the workforce initiative did was they developed and then piloted um, a tool that can be used to gather, um, together with policymakers, actually by policymakers, together with workforce um, in, you know, at, at different levels, to gather information on what the needs of the workforce could be. And the process of running that tool, doing the analysis, and then looking at what could be done with what comes out of the analysis, like running you know, through the whole cycle of evidence creation, and then sitting together, policymakers at some level, you know, I think county and municipal level where the policies actually need to be implemented, that's where most of the, the piloting of this tool has taken place. But really looking at that evidence together among policymakers, NGOs, um, and the frontline workforce, 
and making some decisions about how the policies can be implemented or even upstream, like how they should be changed to be implemented better. Just having a tool, something concrete that you can bring different stakeholders around is really helpful, um, what we found. And there will be some more support to, to the workforce initiative in this donor collaborative that Andrew and I are, are invested in building among the networks. So just that, you know, the idea of having something concrete, I, I would suggest when it comes to workforce. Another is to really, even before you get to that point, to take the time to use some system mapping tools. Andrew and I recently, um, we found a, a really interesting free course on the Acumen Academy website. I can't recommend it enough. They have a lot of really wonderful courses. I've taken a couple of them and I'll be honest, I haven't always finished them, but we did finish this one because they're quite long and you often have to have a team. They work well with a team. Um, it's called Acumen, A-C-U-M-E-N Academy. And okay. one that Andrew and I took with a, another colleague of mine was called Systems Practice. And it, had a, it has a lot of tools from the Omidyar network, which some you and some of the members mm -hmm. are familiar with, um, about how to do a, a full systems map. Um, and then once you have that map in front of you and you see the feedback loops, you see the different actors, you see the constraints and the limitations on, on what you might want to do, um, you can make a decision about where you do want to focus. But it's hard to make an informed decision about where to focus at, you know, at what level. So you can see it all laid out in front of you. Andrew, I don't know, do you want to say anything more about this? Because you were quite involved. Yeah, I, I think the mapping, um, the mapping is critical here. This, this, this for me is back to what I said um, to an earlier answer to the question here, which is, you know, you, you've got mm -hmm. to start by really understanding the scope and the nature of the system you're trying to affect. And, and don't just automatically move straight to the national level because that's what a lot of people do when they're talking about systems. So, you know, get, get your system right and then and then really deeply invest time in mapping it and understanding it, not, not just at the level of bubbles on a piece of paper, but relationships and connections and, and actually what, what are the really, you know, what are the things that drive each other? For me, that mapping stage is really critical. You know, the, part of the issue here is if you take something like workforce um, and you, know, you could apply this to anything, you know, you, you can come in as a foundation. Someone can tell you we're, we're short of qualified, experienced um, kindergarten teachers here. Can you help us? And you can say, yeah, no problem. Uh, we'll put together a course. We'll train 25 people. Um, and, you know, but there's, there's that kind of classic sort of let's directly get in there and, and fix right. what is in reality the symptom. Nevertheless, if you fix it for 25 people, that makes a big difference and it's worthwhile. But, you know, we, we start going up this kind of, Tra trajectory which people always refer to as root causes I'm slightly nervous because every every step along there has got another root cause and I've never quite it's made so it to the end of something without, exactly <laughs> just um, you know there's um yeah you can keep going forever and of course the, the further you go the more abstract it becomes the, the, the bigger it mm. becomes frankly the harder it becomes so that that for me speaks to this logic that there's probably some kind of sweet spot for a particular foundation along that trajectory you, you, you probably want to move along it because you want to do something that's more sustainable and has a bigger effect than just the one-off training mm. course for 25 practitioners. But you right. don't want to go so far along it that you're trying to sort of solve issues of, of mm. equity on planet Earth, you know, which are, which are you know, much more fundamental things. So finding your sweet spot along that trajectory um, and then mapping in detail at the point at which you feel that you're able to make a contribution that, you know, the, the size of the resources, the, the willingness to put time in all of those kind of things. It's, it's a balance to find. Um, and then often I think, you know, the kind of examples Jessica was giving are the more systemic ways you will then find of it. So to find to solve it. So, so we're not going to run the, we're not going to run that workshop for 25 teachers ourselves. We're going to talk to the local teacher training institute to find out what they routinely do and normally do and you know investigate whether there's some way we could collaborate with them to build some programming into their normal system for training you know it's those kind of questions that then become relevant and before long you're usually then thinking about well what are the networks that connect teacher training colleges together um how does that interact with some of the global players that uh, jessica was just talking about how could knowledge be flowing 
in both ways to interact now. And that, that's where these conversations go. But I think you've got to frame it all the time. Otherwise, there's a real risk you're going to be sucked off in uh, directions and avenues that, that ultimately might be interesting, but probably unlikely to produce the kind of results you want. So systems mapping, <clears throat> I mean, I know there's some people are talking about it in Australia, particularly in the earlier sector about that this is something that would be important to do. So we do understand the interrelationships and the connections. Um, so I think that's interesting. I mean, I'd, I'd like to follow up on the Acumen Academy and see what, what tools they have, because I think that systems mapping also at the moment isn't well understood. It means different things to different people and nobody's quite sure what it is. It just sounds like something we should do. And I think that needs to be made more concrete um, so that people can figure out how to use it, what it means. Um, can, we, can we sort of go to, um, give us some examples um, of where you've tackled, you know, complex issues, how you've kind of gone about it, how you've thought about it, how it's, how it's moved along. Um, I think that would be really helpful. Complex issues. Yeah, Andrew, do you want to, I'm going to give that beyond what the examples I've given. I'm trying to think, is there, is there an area you want us to go deeper, Lori, around a, like a specific complex issue? CD or I guess it's, it's thinking about um, the whole notion of you have a complex problem, you need to work with people on the ground, you need to work with systems leaders, you need to, to, to think about all these interconnections. How do you actually make that work? I mean, how, in a concrete way, how can you actually think about making that work? Is that sort of too fuzzy a question? <laughs> no. Andrew, do you want to start? I, um, I, I think that I think there's a series of there's a series of things that people do here that loosely get bundled under the kind of systems change heading, and I'm I'm not sure whether they you know sy systems change is a bit of a concept, isn't it? And various um, concepts and ideas get get borrowed to it, but um, I think in the foundations I work with, I, I'm seeing a number of things going on. Um, one of the most significant is um, foundations shifting away from the idea that their role is to give individual and isolated grants on different topics or themes that they might work in, and much more towards trying to create an orchestrated program of activities, which certainly still consists of those individual grants, but where actually connecting them up, connecting the grants up, connecting up the organizations that are receiving those grants, um, buying into a slightly bigger vision than just the deliverables of the grant. I think this is, this is part of the way, if you, want to affect, if you want to affect the behavior of something as complex as a system, um, and particularly if it's an ecosystem as uh, Jessica was just talking, you know, there's not one door you can go and knock on yeah. and say, if only I hand over a check here and nudge their behavior, then the whole ecosystem is gonna mm -hmm. change. You know, that's, that's not the reality. So, so I think you, part of the consequence of sitting there and mapping things is you begin to come up with a theory of saying, you know, here's a series of entry points and a series of ways in which if we pull things collectively mm -hmm. together, we can affect this. So I, th I, th I think that's, you know, start with the mapping. I, th I think the next stage then is to think about what are the entry points um, mm -hmm. and, and in what way could those collectively be brought together to work? Um, and, I, and I think a big piece of that as well, which um, again, is, is, I, I'm not sure this is anything new either. I think it's the kind of good practice we've seen uh, with foundations for many years, but it, it seems to make even more sense in, in a, um, an ecosystem. It, it's you know it's realizing that particularly in that sort of first shorter term relationships with a new grantee, there's um, and, and particularly when it's around something a little more abstract like systems change, there's it's a longer process you need to go through. There's 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 relationship building that needs to happen here. Um, you know, grantees that go uh, sorry donors that go in with a kind of very um, short term direct you know here's a sum of money here's some outputs we're looking mm -hmm. for. Um, are probably not going in with that kind of longer term relationship building, testing to what extent a, a particular partner is really engaged in, in the same issue, shares similar motivation and understanding 
um, and is willing to go with you on that journey of more deeply understanding, working out how to do things, adjusting course as it goes along. You know, this is the other reality of systems. They're not static. They, you, you can yeah. map them. Yeah. <laughs> you can map yeah. them in enormous detail and then they, they yeah. very unreasonably yeah. start changing the following day, you know. So, so yeah. you need partners with, you need, you need to find partners and to work with organisations and through networks that are willing to go on a journey here and to adapt their course as the system changes um, as you go. So those are practical steps. Um, I, I was just thinking again, back to the, Jessica, you might just want to come in a bit more on this, but um, you know, the, the re, these four regional networks um, that, that Jessica was talking about, okay, this is a global example and I appreciate many people listening to this will be thinking in the context of, of one country or maybe two or three yeah. countries, but you know, these networks exist at just about every level, um, mm -hmm. right the way through the world, don't they? Whether it's at a national level, a regional level and so on. But you know, in this particular case, um, you, you do start with a kind of um, piece of logic and theory that says, what, what's, what's our hypothesis about one or two of the things that are, um, difficult or uh, not quite working in the sector what, what what's the, what's the issue with the system that we see um, and and part I guess part of the hypothesis sitting behind um, the work with the regional networks is one of saying actually we've got some amazing work going on a global level um, in, and, I, and I'm thinking here about the, the great work that's been done over the in the last few years now with the nurturing care framework, for example, and assembling a mm. body of science and evidence behind that, that really is, you know, has made a phenomenally powerful case for early childhood. You know, the work of the Harvard Centre um, mm -hmm. in particular, I, you know, there's a, there's a global body of knowledge that's sitting there, uh, which is great. You know, on the flip side of the coin, um, at a local, uh, local level, mm -hmm. we've also got amazing experience going on that's contextually rich, that people, um, people are really getting in and beginning to work out in practical terms what does it take uh, to, to achieve change on the ground, what actually really works for uh, for children and families and so on. But actually, you know, when you, so you're looking at these two worlds and admiring both and then realising actually the two are rather poorly interconnected. Um, sometimes when some of this global work is going on, um, it's, it's sort of sent in broadcast mode to the rest of the world. And then people look in surprise when it's not picked up. Um, and and some, of, some of that local experience isn't feeding its way back to say, actually, could this global work be, could be uh, better refined, better explained if it only understood our context? So that, you know, there's a problem. And, and you know, when Jessica talks about the global local dynamic, I guess that's, that's a big piece of, uh, of, of what we mean by that. So, so that then you get into the whole question, okay, what, what can we do? How can we, how can we now get the system working better together so that it's, you know, one side isn't in broadcast mode, the other side is being heard. Um, and the, and the, the knowledge in both directions is actually informing everything. That, that's what takes you into the kind of thinking of saying, okay, in that particular case, networks are hugely important. That, that's how we interconnect people. Uh, learning communities are hugely important because we we don't want people just to be in broadcast mode. We want them to have deep, rich conversations about what's going on, um, and that's where you start to make decisions about investing in the kind of examples that uh, uh, Jessica you were just talking about. Yeah, I mean, I have a mentor, Lori, who said once, um, "Culture eats strategy for lunch, <laughs> sometimes dinner." Right, <laughs> so. If we only have all of these strategies, you know, without understanding how it's going to hit the ground and run or not. Um, and that's why when I when, you know, we talk about this global local dynamic, all of the science we, you know, getting behind the science is something that Porticus is invested in. We, we are partnering in the ECD program that I manage with the Harvard Center for the Developing Child. So they're one of the partners that are in this with us. And um, you know, we're thinking together, how, how do we test how this science is applied effectively in different contexts? That's part of our partnership within, within this program. And learning together, you know, the, the partners on the, in the regional um, and national context where, where we're working are investigating, and Harvard is also learning from how it, like, you know, how are they learning about their approach? But at the heart of everything is the science. The science is the, the foundation. And you, I know you know Nancy Palix, and she you know, has done a phenomenal job of putting that at the center of their 
across a number of different um, a, a number of different lines, right? By by just focusing on the science. And this whole child approach is, is very much at the center of what we're doing. And if we want to create, we know there's enough research and you know, there's more going on about the need to create whole systems that because whole systems create whole children. And what we're after are whole human beings, right? Who can really embrace all of the potential that they have. I mean, that's the promise of, of ECD and why so many of us are invested in it. But um, trying to understand how to put, you can't understand how to put whole systems together if you don't go into it with this partnership, um, you know, collaborative and global local dynamic at the center of it. So you had asked for practical examples and I can come back, you know, we talked about the networks, we talked about mm -hmm. the Saving Brains uh, partnership that we have, which is really investing in strengthening organizations so that they can better take their initiatives to scale. But just very practically in terms of our way of working, we do the mapping, we do the problem identification, you know, out of all of the things that we could focus on in this dynamic, ever-changing ecosystem that we're part of, where do, we, where do we want to focus? And for us, it's really whole child development at scale and trying to work with different institutions at different levels that can help with that. And we create a program framework, so a strategic collection of grants that all have um, one or two system level objectives that they're contributing to in a series of different outcomes at different levels. And really working with our board over the last five years or so to understand, you know, to understand the time, <laughs> the time frame, and you know, how much time do we need in order to actually see a contribution um, towards those intermediate and objectives. But the first is building this framework with the understanding that it's at least 10 year, you know, 10 mm -hmm horizon that we have to look at with different phases and cycles. And then assembling the right group of partners within that framework who are all going to be able to collectively form another actor in this ecosystem. Individually, they are actors. But what mm -hmm. we're aiming for is to create another actor in the framework of this program that will make strategic um, impact together. And uh, one of my other programs in the education and emergency sector, we have um, a monitoring, evaluation, and learning partner. I can't stress enough the importance of having a really good monitoring, evaluation, and learning partner for strategic programming um, from the beginning to help you think about, you know, what does impact look like at this kind of system and ecosystem level? Because it looks like attitude changes. It looks like mindset shifts. It looks like behavior changes which are notoriously difficult to measure. And we're really, I'm, I'm actually really excited. Some, you know, some people do not get excited about these things, but I get excited about thinking, you know, how can we collectively start to measure on a continuum changes that show you that the culture is shifting? Because at the end of the day, that's what it is that we're after, right? Is for people right. to thinking about, thinking about it differently and acting in ways that reflect that new thinking. And it's not about counting the number of kids who have been served. I mean, that's important as well, the track of um, this open scale of what you're doing, but really tracking in the, in the water of the ecosystem, if you will, how we're, we're contributing to shifts in the overall culture that are going to support a new way of approaching this. And um, for this emergency mm -hmm. program, just one last point, with our MEL partner, we, um, we did something that we call the state of the ecosystem report, and we really tried to get a baseline of sorts on a couple of different dimensions of the ecosystem that we want to focus on. Quality of the intervent, you know, what does quality education or early childhood mean? What does evidence mean? And how is evidence yeah. being generated and used differently? A couple of key dimensions for all of us in the partnership that we now have as a kind of small B baseline that we'll be looking over the course of, you know, the next three, six, nine years, how some of those are changing and what could we say about our contribution to that change. So these are, I mean, depending on your orientation, again, if you have a board that's excited and a team that's excited about it, but thinking differently about, about impact and how we would go about looking at looking for change is, can be exciting. I, I, I agree. I, I love that stuff. I've done a lot of e <clears throat> evaluation, developmental evaluation, and um, and I think it really helps us understand and see what we're doing. 
um, because these systems, as we keep saying, they're complex, they're constantly changing, nothing sort of stays static. We have to be very alert um, to what's going on around us, looking for the opportunities where we might be able to leverage some change because something may pop up we never thought of and something we thought might be useful turns out, you know, the door's closed. Um, so what I'm, what I'm hearing is, I'm just trying to sort of put this together quickly and I may not do it very well, but that there are a number of things. One is science is important. We, we want to know something about what science tells us. I mean, that really is important. We need to define our systems and map them. So we do need to, to do some work on what are we talking about here? What are we really trying to influence? If it is an ecosystem, reminds me of sort of the Bronfenbrenner concentric circles, all influencing each other, um, <clears throat> that we need to, to get a handle on that and do the mapping. Um, <clears throat> and then it's creating these different levels of networks or connections or partnerships, um, alliances. Um, so it, it is complex, but it seems like you can begin to step it out. Probably didn't do it terribly well in that summary, but um, it does seem to me that there are some things that kind of jump out. Um, and one of the things, let me just sort of, I had you for quite a long time, so we'll probably have to wrap up, but um, one of the things that we're grappling with in Australia in the earlier sector is fragmentation. There's a lot going on, a mm -hmm. lot of activity, a lot of it's really great innovative, efficacious. I mean, there's some really good stuff. It's not aligned. And I think that that lack of alignment prevents us from having the impact that we might be able to have. Can you talk about that notion a bit? Because it's kind of a live conversation here in the early years. Um, how, do we, how do we generate that kind of alignment? Maybe systems mapping would help. Maybe that's part of what you do. Um, do you have any other sort of comments about that? Um, let me just try something, Laurie, because I, I, th I think your summary was, was great. Um, mm. it, it, if I'd add one thing to it, it's also the recognition of change over time. So, um, you know, foundations, yes. I think, are guilty sometimes of investing a huge amount of effort in the design of a program and much less in its ongoing um, evolution and I think if you're serious about systems changing you've got to be serious about your program changing um, to, to match that um, you know one of the examples I like I uh, back in 2013 I, I worked uh, for a number of years as head of research and learning at Lego and you know that, that's a good example of where at that stage we identified an issue which was about the way that, um, the ECD sector was thinking and talking about play you know we um, one of my colleagues went to a conference and um, asked a question about play and was told not to mention the P word because it discredited early years provision that, you know, we were, we were serious yeah. about learning and education and this, play. this play stuff was trivial. And actually that was a wake up call to say, actually, there's a real problem here that people have got to a stage where they think play isn't relevant in early years. And, you know, go back to yes. what Jessica was saying about holistic learning and so on. That's got, that's got big implications. So, so you've got an example there of a foundation that works out, okay, we, we've got a problem and an issue here. Uh, we're going to stick with this one for the long term. But actually, we don't know quite how this is going to play out over a number of years. We've got to change the way a lot of people are thinking and talking uh, and so on. And, you know, that's what, so that kind of guiding star of saying we, we know what we're aiming at. We, we really want the world to think about learning through play in positive terms as opposed to something yeah. we've got to hide. Uh, we, we want it to be part of that early years experience as a kind of strong guiding message mm -hmm. for that, that willingness to then think flexibly over many years about the best way to achieve it is actually what, what you've got to be willing to do if, you, if you're going to see that change. Yeah. I, you, so you, you also, you just asked very practically there about, you know, lots of stuff going on. There's lots of stuff going on everywhere, isn't there? And, and isn't, isn't that the nature of ecosystems? Um, you, you, the first thing you've got to dis I think the first thing you've got to accept with an ecosystem, whether it's at the level of a country or a, a province, wherever it is, is that it's full of autonomous independent players. Um, you, you've actually almost got to start by accepting that. 
and, and I think yes mapping does help because you can begin to understand that you can begin to one of the great things the saving brains does is actually it, it sort of does some mapping of ecosystems and of players um, and then it encourages people to ask a question which is okay we've connected organization to organization x to y on our map um, what, what's the give and the get what what's what what is it right. that why why because people don't come back mm. to a relationship unless there's a give and a get you know we've all been ripped off in a shop and we never go back there again so, that, so there's right. got to be a give and a get and in an ecosystem i'm afraid it's, it's more complicated because it's not just a binary give and get between two players in an ecosystem we might have a hundred players um and so there's lots of gives and gets going on uh, between those different players and and of course if you want people to align you've got to create more synergistic gives and gets. You, you, you've, you've got to have more of those heading in a, in a common shared direction. Um, exactly. you know, the, the other thing that uh, I've seen with the Saving Brains work is um, increasingly a realization when you start to map it like that, that you as the kind of either the foundation or the innovator aren't actually really at the center of that picture. Um, you're, you're just another player in it. And often people begin to realize that actually some of the other relationships uh, that you're not directly involved in are even more important than the ones you're directly involved in, in terms of how the system behaves. Um, so I, I think it's, it's necessary to get behind that and then start asking yourself the question of how can we just slowly and steadily start to align those gives and gets so we create lots of win-wins, wins all over the, the system in a shared common direction. If you get that, if it's worth people coming back for more because they buy into what it's about and they feel that something's coming back to them, then, then, then you get that win, win, win. Yeah, I would add to that to say about this. Oh, sorry, Laurie. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, would, I would just add to that to say, yes, it's about identifying the incentives, like those you know, win wins. And I would offer the idea that learning, understanding what people want to or need to learn and putting learning as one of the central concepts is really important. That's the, you know, the peer learning communities at Saving Brains and also within these regional networks that I've spoken about in many other examples, people come, people are more likely, there's been a million studies of teachers, for example, I was a teacher and I can vouch for this being true, that teachers want to learn, will listen to what other teachers tell them. They won't listen to what experts and some university necessarily says is the right thing. But if other teachers or people who've been, other te been teachers um, have adopted something and they get together in a group, teachers are more likely to do it. And I think you could say the same for any other profession out there, especially social service or helping professions, nurses and so forth. People, we all have to trust people who are in the same situation as us, right? So if they wanna learn something and we think we can benefit from that too, or if they have knowledge, then we can get together for a shared learning. So I would say learning to definitely make one of those incentive, you know, win-win, bi-directional win-win and in, in incentives uh, around that. And to combine that kind of learning and incentive agenda with the, the nudges as well. And maybe even to deeply understand something that I'm trying to, to learn myself about a little bit more is what does create behavior change? Because at the end of the day, systems are people and people are who we want to change. Like whether it's policymakers, parents, we want them to, to listen to the science. We want them to focus on you know, holistic uh, types of activities because that's what children need. And especially children in adversity, I think a lot of philanthropies in one way or the other are focused on some kind of adversity, right? For us, it's, it's deeply embedded in all of the work uh, that we're doing. But, and we know that the science says children in adversity need whole child approaches, which is why we, we put them together at scale, right? So I think, uh, yeah, there, there's a lot to be explored around learning and around what creates behavior change in that direction. and really understanding the people whose behavior we want to change. Because I, I would also say something that I realized as well is we create a lot of um, interventions for ourselves. We think, okay, this is what it would take for me to change my behavior. These are the incentives I need. But this is where that mapping going, you know, doing the overall map and then really going deeply with local knowledge, with local expertise in the area where you want to focus. Who are these? Uh, who are the people that we we really want to make some change in the parents? And what do they respond to? Like, what do they want to learn? What you know? What does it take to nudge them in a certain direction? And getting in there, like the saving brains, you know, leaders do, mm -hmm. listening to them and putting 
that overall change above everything else, you know, not about what I want or how I think the change should happen. And, you know, coming back to how do you make that argument to the board? It's, it is a bi-directional piece there too, because we all have a way of thinking things should go this way, but you, you have to make this triangulation between what, you know, how the board is willing to work, how much risk they're willing to take, how comfortable they are with ambiguity and unknown and abstract, what the needs actually are and what it will take to change the behavior where you're trying to make an impact. And then, you know, your, your limitations in terms of your programming and ways of working in between and, and where your relationships are. So. I know you want to wrap up, Laurie, but the, um, the I, I, Jessica's comment there just reminds me of, of the work that um, is being done by Thrive by Five in Australia, where, I, you know, I think mm -hmm. I, I was listening to uh, Jay Weatherall on a call recently, just talking about that testing of messaging with parents and really beginning to deeply understand which messages resonate and make the difference again. I, you know, I think it's a superb example of exactly what Jessica was saying. Yep. And I think, I mean, that the Frameworks Institute work on how to talk about things effectively. Yeah. Um, one of the first pieces I read, I think, was something to do with parenting, and I was thinking, oh my god, you know, I've been using all the wrong language, talking in the wrong way, um, but those are things, I mean, we need to be conscious, I guess, we need to be thinking consciously about that stuff, because it really does make a difference, doesn't it? I mean, it's, it makes a huge difference. Um, one of the, one of the things that I think really is important out of this, too, is that that notion of communities of practice, of having ongoing opportunities to test your ideas, to share them, to build on them, to interrogate them in safe spaces that just, just being sure that everybody knows the science, for example, neuroscience, brain development, whatever, isn't enough. There has to be an opportunity to contextualize it and actually use it. Um, so I think that's something that's really important. And I'm not sure that in Australia, we've invested in that. But that's another sort of part of system change, I guess, is, is doing that, supporting those communities of practice so that people actually can change their behavior, and they have some kind of support for doing so. Um, so I think, yeah, this has been fantastic. Um, I guess, um, we are going to have to wind it up. So I'm going to ask you if there are any other little sort of nuggets that you want to put on the table before we have to wrap up. What do you think? And just one nugget. Jessica, one nugget. <laughs> one My, nugget. I, I, I'm not, I, I have nothing pre-prepared, but what you just said actually um, really reminds me of, you know, a mistake I have, think I have seen people make, which is the, you know, it's very, it's very linear assumptions about what will change a system. So a classic mm -hmm. one is, if only we have the evidence, then policymakers yeah. will change what they do, and the problem will be solved. And, that, you know, that's a, that's a, it's a good example of that. And, and of course, evidence is critically important, and we should have it, but we shouldn't fall into the trap of believing that evidence alone fixes anything and uh, I think most of us who have been around in the sector long enough have seen stuff change without any evidence whatsoever um, and we've also seen situations where brilliant evidence has resulted in no change so um, I, I think it's a good reminder that change actually is a fairly complex thing there's multiple things that need to come together probably with a sprinkling of a bit of luck and, a, and an awful lot of perseverance so I, I think that's um, that's my yeah. kind of you know be, be realistic about what you're trying to achieve here, scope and scale it appropriate to your, your genuine tolerance and willingness for dealing with ambiguity, dealing with long time frames. Yep. Um, but also at the end of the day, hopefully having a, you know, a massively larger impact um, than is possible by some of the more direct means that um, you know, have, have been the more traditional bread and butter of the sector. I think that's the, that's the tempting um, positive at the other end. Right. I would, I would add to that, I guess my nugget would be invest in agency of different organizations in a way that promotes collaboration between them as well. You know, you have to invest in both, both ends of the, of the spectrum, I guess. Like for example, with the regional network, we invested in having them um, have some support from a network, an, an organization called Network Impact to really look at their strategies, identify each of their weaknesses and strengths 
and then also think, what would they gain from working collaboratively? So first looking at them as individuals, what do they do really well? And trying to think of ways that we as funders can support them to have that autonomy, to, to do what they say is important for them to do strategically in their own context, but then to support the collaborative piece. So the, the individual action and the collaborative um, action in order to have the greatest impact. You're gonna have impact with, you know, if you have strong agency in, mm -hmm. in like investing in their agency, their ability to say, this is what I think is gonna work based on all of the evidence that I've collected, all of the thing that I've done, but also helping them and also yourself recognize that I can have the greatest impact only by acting individually. I have to work together with others. So I need to identify those relationships that are really critical for achieving mm -hmm. the, the impacts in, in complementary ways. I also think that we have a tendency to think about collaboration by going towards those who are most like us. But actually something that I've learned is the best collaborations can be with those who are not the most like us, but mo those who fill in where we um, might have some weaknesses. Yeah, sometimes I, we talk about unlikely allies, exactly. but you're right. The tendency is to go to the ones you know and have interacted with and feel comfortable with, but sometimes bringing in unlikely allies um, is, I mean, just, just in terms of, um, of neuroscience and brain development and all of that kind of stuff, which is something that a lot of work is going on in Australia, um, business understands that better than a lot of people making social policy, actually. Um, so we wouldn't have thought necessarily that that would be the place to go for getting help with you know, changing systems, but thinking that yes, all sorts of unlikely allies also can play a role um, and have, have something to contribute. Um, I'm, I like the, um, I love the culture eat strategy for lunch. I love the gives and gets, Andrew. I think there's something really powerful in that when you're trying to bring people together, especially people who haven't worked together before, who don't really understand quite what might happen. They need, need to focus on um, thinking about. So what, what are the benefits and what do I have to give? And I think understanding each other's constraints as well as resources um, and abilities, being sensitive to the fact that if a foundation, for example, is a bit risk averse, understanding that and still being willing to work with that understanding. Um, so I think that that, oh, that very rich dialogue, there's a lot of